talk about Jesus at the door. We're going to talk about Jesus at the door. And it is a text taken from the book of Thessalonians. This past summer, my wife spent a month in Greece, and I was able to accompany her for a week in Greece. And I said, I want to go to Thessalonica or Thessaloniki. This is the city where Paul went and opened the gospel. And so we traveled, we rented a car, and we went north from Athens all the way to Thessaloniki. And when I got there, I said, where is the ancient city? I was asking around. This is, we stopped at a place to have some veggie burgers. And they said it's only two blocks away. So I ran there after our lunch. And you got to look down to look at the ancient city of Thessaloniki. It is 30 feet below the present level of the city. And you can walk down a ramp, and you can see the museum of the things that they have found. Now, why is that city called Thessaloniki, from where we get the word Thessalonians? Well, she was the wife of a king. She was the wife of a general, Cassander. If you remember your prophecy, I know Pastor Andrade will remember, so will Brother Glenn, that leopard with four heads. One of those heads was Cassander, the general of Alexander the Great. And Cassander admired Alexander the Great so much that he married Alexander's sister. And her name was Thessalonica. And so he said, I'm going to give you a city. I'm going to name a city after you. And that city is named after the sister of Alexander the Great, Thessalonica. It is a very big city. I want to say it's probably the second city of Greece today. Still today, it is blessed. And as we toured the city, we could see the public baths. I mean, the ancient city. You can see it in a couple of hours. Walk through it and look at the ancient baths, the public baths, the agora, which was the place where they all gathered, the theater, there was a beautiful theater there, there were stores, there was a medical office, and then I was surprised to learn that above the first floor, there was a second floor, and it was an area of prostitution. So where families and children were below buying in the shops, others could go on the top floor, and experience immorality at its fullest. The exploitation of women, and I am assuming of some children, and maybe of young men. And then, First of Thessalonians chapter four, verse three says, "This is sanctification that you will abstain from fornication." Holiness, you know, this was a new concept for the Greeks. I want to tell you it's a new concept for young people today. That God expects you to avoid and abstain from fornication. That he can bless you in your marriage in a special way. That you don't need, be, need to be comparing with others. That you don't have to put yourself at risk for ven uh, venereal disease or mental illness. But Paul... In his letter to the Thessalonians, I want you to know that is the oldest book we have in the New Testament. The oldest book. It was the first one that was written. It was written before the Gospels. The Gospel or the Epistle to the Thessalonians. And in chapter 5, we find Paul reminiscing about his Jewish roots. Can we go there, please? In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5, it says, You are the children of light and the children of the day. You are not of the night nor of darkness. In Paul's day, there was a group of Jews. They were called the 
as scenes. I mean, we hear about the Pharisees in Scripture. We hear about the Sadducees. We hear about the Herodians. But we don't have one verse that specifically mentions the Essenes, but they existed. Um, I've been to Israel. I've been next to the Dead Sea. And they had a big community. This branch of Judaism, listen to them. They were, they called themselves the sons of light. They believed in separating from the world. They believed in baptism. They had these mitvahs that they would go in for ritual cleansing. They believed in the Bible. They held it as a special treasure from God, and they copied the Bible. They had scriptoriums, and they copied the scriptures. They were ascetic. They believed in health reform. But they also knew that the world would end, and that there would be a major battle at the end. And they believed that as the children of light, they would fight against the enemies of Israel who were the sons of darkness. The Roman Empire came and destroyed their village, destroyed their branch of Judaism. Now we too are the children of light. We're the sons and daughters of light. We also believe in the end of time. We also believe in country living. We also believe in this imminent return of the Messiah and of the final Armageddon of the powers of darkness that will fight against the powers of light. But you know what Jesus said when he compared the sons of light to the sons of darkness? Speak with me. Luke chapter 16, verse 8. Luke 16, verse 8. He praises, praises these sons of darkness for something that he wishes that as the children of light, we harvest. Luke 16, 8. And the Lord commended the unjust steward because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. In America, we have a big tower. It's called One World. One tower that stands up in New York, which is the capital of the world. You can find pretty much every nation on earth represented in New York. And this reform movement has several congregations in New York, the city that never sleeps. And this new world order, this one world order that is coming, is going to be led by two powers on earth. And it seems that this new generation of the children of darkness, the children of the world, seem to be very smart. They have something new. They have something they called A, and then they've added another letter, I, artificial intelligence. This artificial intelligence is now being used to diagnose and to treat illness. This artificial intelligence is being used in war, in the development of weapons. Now they have these drones with artificial intelligence that they can program the facial features of someone and that drone will go everywhere until it finds them. You can run, the President of the United States said, but you cannot hide, we will catch you. And they did. They caught Osama bin Laden. They had this bird that looked like a real bird. Even other birds wanted to attack it. And it was the product of artificial intelligence taking pictures of where Obama bin Laden was. Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden. We have fart uh, smartphones now. They track where we are. They tell us where we take our pictures. They even tell us where we're going to go. You come into your car early in the morning and it'll say, to get here, it'll take so long. Traffic is light or traffic is heavy. And as a matter of fact, if you start to talk about something that you want to buy, you're going to see ads regarding what you've been talking about on your computer because it has ears. It is listening. 
These are idols that now talk, that now see, and that now hear, and people worship. New confederacies are forming in our world today. Businesses are becoming bigger and more transnational. I remember a young man that came from Holland to the United States, and he told his dad, look, they have Walmart here, also in America, like we do in Holland. And we chuckle in America because that was born in America. People want American food. They want American clothes. They want American music. They want American films. They want to talk like Americans. And I'm sorry to say they're going to end up with Americans' government. There are three new publications that I want to share with you. There are many, but we're going to look at three of these that I think announced to us that Jesus is coming back and we need to prepare, that Jesus is at the door. And we can peek through the window and say, he is coming, I can see him. Make sure you have everything organized. You tell your wife, I've invited someone home. And what will she say? Wait a moment, I need to clean the place. I need to have everything in order because the house is a reflection of the woman and not of the man. So if a man comes to your house, don't worry, because he's just he's going to overlook everything. But if a woman comes, you worry, because she's going to pick you out. Look how dirty this was. I don't like the colors she had. Oh, look at those curtains. They're so dated. How can it be? This is part of our nature. But listen, we need to pick out the signs of the times in our home and our planet that announced the imminent return of Jesus. The first one is from the United Nations, which happens to be in New York. They have just signed a new accord in September 2024. It is announcing to us that Jesus is at the doors. When we read it with a spiritual insight, it is titled The Pact for the Future. The Pact for the Future. I made a photocopy of it, of the first page. I downloaded this document and here it is. United Nations Summit of the Future Outcome Document September 2024. The Pact for the Future Global Digital Compact and the Declaration of future generations. What is the future according to the United Nations? How do they look at the future? Come with me to the oldest book of the New Testament. First of Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3. And you're going to see what they say. This is exactly taken out of scripture without knowing. Because scripture predicted what will be the cry. In the end of times, before the return of Christ and glory. First of Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. For when they shall say peace and security. Peace and security. I read from the translation called the Revised Standard Version. And it says, when people say there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them. As travail comes upon a woman with a child, and there will be no escape. There's another translation I like, which is the New English Bible. The New English Bible, and it says, when they are talking of peace and security. And we're talking about peace and security. I downloaded this document. It is 920 pages and we're so blessed in America today and in all the Western world here in Australia and in England where we have the internet. We can download things on a PDF file for free and we can search. And you know what I search for? I put in peace and security. And I was a bit surprised. It is cited in that document, peace and security. It appears 39 times. There's even a special section called 
international peace and security. I mean, it can't be a bit. It's action number 12. We plan for the future and strengthen our collective efforts. We're planning for the future. This is the agenda for sustainable development 2030. International peace and security number 32. The global security landscape is undergoing profound transformation, they say. And the United Nations has an indispensable role in the maintenance of international peace and security. Our efforts to urgently address the accumulating and diverse threats to international peace and security on land, at sea, in the air, in outer space, and in, listen to this, cyberspace. Cyberspace. Should be supported by efforts to rebuild trust, strengthen solidarity, deepen international cooperation, including through the intensified use of diplomacy. I mean, it sounds beautiful. You know, who doesn't want peace? Who doesn't want security? But you know what? We're giving up our security. We're giving, let me rephrase that. We're giving up our liberties, our personal, individual, society liberties in the name of, quote, security, unquote. The government is getting more into our affairs. There is more diligent surveillance everywhere surveillance everywhere and anywhere and we say it's okay because it's for peace and security we had a pastor in the united states who passed away his name was pastor lambert kazelhoff and i heard him give a service that i never have forgotten it was on this text of first of thessalonians chapter 5 verse 3 peace and security. Listen to what he said. I'm going to give it to you in one sentence. The world is going to be deceived by the peace offered through the papacy and the security offered through America. He preached that the Vatican was offering peace and that the United States was offering security to the world. And the United Nations is going to rely on both the Vatican and the United States of America to accomplish its international peace and security. Let's go to the second document. The Vatican solution. There is much talk today about climate change, global warming, carbon footing and the environment. <clears throat> the Vatican has come up with a solution for our common good. Get this, this is the common good. And to protect the environment from climate change, Pope Francis has issued an encyclical letter, and he titled it, On Care for Our Common Home. Do we not live in the same home? Australia and America and England Live the same home. Oh, here it is. On um, care for our common home. And it's called Laudato Si in Latin. Laudato is to praise. To praise Him is what it says. To praise Him. Well, in this document, in paragraph 237, 237, I have a copy of it here for those that would like it. He states, and I quote, 237, on Sunday, we're talking about the climate and saving the climate. There's a solution, Sunday. On Sunday, our participation in the Eucharist, which is the Catholic term for the Lord's communion, has a special importance. Sunday, like the Jewish Sabbath, is meant to be a day which heals our relationships with God and with the world. The solution to heal the world is Sunday. Sunday is the day of the resurrection and the first day of the new creation. 
The law, listen, the law of weekly rest forbade work on the seventh day. And so the day of rest centered on the Eucharist sheds its light on the whole week and motivates us to greater concern for nature and the poor. This is a solution for poverty. This is a solution for nature's disease of climate change. This is the new day of rest. It is Sunday. And as it was legislated in the Old Testament in the Jewish theocracy, it needs to be legislated today. It was an earlier document by John Paul II. That was more explicitly stated regarding the Sunday law, because in that document, John Paul II, it's called Dies Domini, the day of the Lord, he publicly and uh, stated that we need a Sunday law. He said it just like that. Paragraphs 66 and paragraph 67, he advocated for a Sunday law. I have it here. Let me read it to you. And it says, St. Augustine notes in turn, therefore the Lord too has placed his seal on his day, which is the third after Passover. In the weekly cycle, it is the eighth day after the seventh, that is the Sabbath, the first day of the week in the Domini. Did you know that the week has eight days? According to the papacy, there are eight days. And the day after the Sabbath is Sunday, and this is the seal of God. He says, God has placed his seal on this day. And all are asked to promote this day, to encourage governments to bring about such a law, a new law. Now, in this book, Laudato Si, I go back to the most recent encyclical letter of the Pope. It says, oh, here, I found it. <clears throat> Let me read it to you. It's paragraph 66. The Sunday rest is the worker's right which the state must guarantee. What is Sunday? The worker's right that the state must guarantee. In our own historical context, the obligation to ensure everyone can enjoy the freedom and rest on Sunday. We're obligated. The next paragraph says, therefore, also in particular circumstances of our own time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. There you have it in black and white. He is the meaning John Paul II. But Francis said something else is a little more subtle. He says the church is to bring about peace and to bring the protection of the environment. And to do this, there is urgent need of a true world political authority. And who do you think that true world political authority is that the papers is talking about? That's in Laudato Si, and it's on page 155 and 156. But there's a third document. That's the last one I want to talk about. And this one comes from America. What is happening in America is also telling that Jesus is at the door. America is obsessed with security, as the papacy is with peace. We've created a department. It's called the Department of Homeland Security. And America markets a defense security system called the Global Patriot. Maybe you've seen it in Israel in the recent war against Hamas and Hezbollah and against Iran. These countries send missiles, missiles to, 
to Israel, and Israel shoots them in the air. Hundreds at one time, they shoot them and destroy them in the air. The Global Patriot Air Defense Solution is a missile defense system consisting of radars, command to control technology, multiple types of interceptors, all working together to detect, identify, and defeat tactical ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, drones, advanced aircraft, and other threats. President Ronald Reagan says, he was going to put in action a dome, an iron dome of protection. And we see it. We also now have a new dimension of security, cybersecurity. You can't open your laptop. You have no security unless you have cybersecurity. In America now, these young people, they're whizzes on computers. They will take hostage all the medical information of a hospital. They don't care if people are going to die because you can't access their records. Everything is digital. It's no longer on these written charts. Everything is digital. And they take it hostage. They have taken hostages. Even cities through cyber attacks. And they plan to have an influence on the coming election. Well, in the United States, there is a group of conservative Republicans, and they have devised the project for 2025, when the new government will take over. It is called the Mandate for Leadership, the Conservative Promise Project 2025. It's a big document. I went online, I heard about it. And I downloaded it. Here it is. Mandate for Leadership. Project 2025. And then I did the same thing. I did a search. Can it be that they talk about Sunday in this document? And I put Sunday. Boom! There it is. Would you like to hear what it says? It says there. It's on page 589 on the Mandate for Leadership. Sabbath rest. That's what it's called. Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest. And until recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. And they say in the next paragraph, Congress should encourage communal rest. Amending the Fair Labor Standards Act to require that workers be paid time and a half hours for working on the Sabbath. And that day would default to Sunday. They said default to Sunday. So we see a preliminary, a preliminary movement taking place, trying to make it more expensive for people to work on Sunday so that businesses will give that day off. And that it will be mandated by the government. Congress, they're asking Congress to start issuing laws. Says the result will be that they will not require work on the Sabbath, meaning Sunday. So that individuals in roles that sometimes do require Sabbath work are empowered to achieve the desired schedule. And you see that Jesus is at the door. The things are moving, the confederacies are moving in the United Nations, in the papacy, in Washington, D.C. Sister White wrote in Selected Messages, Volume 3, 387, our own land is to become the battlefield on which is to be carried on the struggle for religious liberty. Religious liberty. To worship God according to the dictates of our own conscience. Shall men cry peace and safety now when sudden destruction is coming upon the world? Do you feel at peace? Do you feel secure? You got a job? Or you have retirement? A pension? You have a car? You have a house? You don't worry about where you're going to get your meal. Well, after the service, it's going to be a free and meal. You can go about, 
You're not in fear that the authorities are going to stop you and say, show me your papers. You're in Australia. One of the richest nations on earth. What happens in America will affect Australia. You will not escape. Will affect the England because we're allies. And I tell you, this small group of people want to do it for good reasons, but they're going about it the wrong way. You cannot legislate religion. Religion must be an outpouring of the heart. God does not force anyone to follow him. He gives liberty to choose. And it's ironic that America, who was founded by the Sons of Liberty, will outlaw liberty for the sake of security, for the sake of peace, for the sake of changing and controlling the monetary, the economics. Let me tell you something. Years ago, I went to Brazil. Brother Fernando, I was there in Brazil with my dad because he had relatives in Cuba and we wanted to send money to Cuba. And we heard from Brazil it's easy because it was a socialist government. We could send money directly to Cuba. Dad wanted to send money to help. At that time, he still had some of his brothers who were alive. This was last century. And uh, I was there with him. We went to a banker. We said, look, we want to set up an account. We'll put in dollars and we'll call and we'd like some money to be sent to Cuba. Because we can't do it from the state. Oh, you're Americans? He says, yes, we're Americans. So we got the money. You don't have to fear. We'll pay you. He says, yes, but I have to fear. We cannot send any money because America controls all the international movement of funds. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they see that we're going to send money to Cuba, they're going to ask who's sending it, and we're going to have to say it was you in the U.S. The economy worldwide, yes, they talk about making the ruble and making the Chinese currency and the Japanese. Yet, look, prophecy says it's going to be America. None of that is going to succeed. Not even the euro. It's all tied to the dollar. For the sake of security and peace. And as America goes, so goes the world. I read a book recently titled Sunday. Uh, I knew the author, Justo Gonzalez. He's a professor, now an emeritus professor from Atlanta, from the University of uh, Emory, Emory University. And he's written a lot about Christian history. He's He's a scholar in this area, and he wrote a book on Sundays. It's interesting. I'm going to buy it. I read it. And this is what he says. Historians always suffer from the temptation to turn history into prophecy. Within the church, Sunday will regain more and more meaning. Even in the 21st century, in the United States of America, the laws regarding Sunday still have a great attraction for a significant majority of conservative Christians who believe that the civil government has the obligation to guarantee that the law of God, including Sunday rest, is to be obeyed not just by faithful Christians, but by all society. That's in his book, A Brief History of Sunday, by Justo L. Gonzalez, a Cuban-American. Professor of History at American University. So historians are seeing this. Intellectuals are seeing this. We're coming down this road. And I fear for my beloved country. As I look back century of what happened in Nazi Germany, they had the greatest level of economic prosperity. They had the greatest military. They had the greatest science. And people were mute. I love with what one Jewish man wrote. He says, they came, they came for, maybe it wasn't written by a Jew, maybe it was written by somebody else, but they came for those that were Jewish and they took, and I said nothing because I wasn't Jewish. Then they came for those that were special, mentally 
uh, dysfunctional. And they took them, and I didn't worry because it wasn't me. Then they came for the Roma, for the gypsies. And I didn't say anything because it wasn't me. And then they came for me. And no one spoke because there was nobody else. We need to raise our voices in favor of religious liberty. And I end with this thought. It's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul says, we are not the children of night. We can't fall asleep in this time. We're the children of day. We need to be wide awake. Even if there is a time change, a day change, a week change. And in verse 6, it says, therefore... Let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. That Greek word is nepho. And nepho means not to drink. Not to drink. But drink no wine. To be sober. To us it has a double meaning. Because we cannot drink the wine of that wine. We cannot drink the wine of false teachings. It'll confuse us. We can't be a tourist at every single place that the name of Jesus is called. You must follow the truth. Look for God's people and stay with them because the time is coming where he's going to pass rope. Literally, we need to abstain from alcohol and drugs that fog the mind and interfere with our reasoning power. We need to abstain from every stimulating food. We are called to be vegetarian in this time and age. But spiritually, it means not to be contaminated with the wine of Babylon, with the false teachings of Babylon. Babylon has two pillars. One is the immortality of the soul, and the other is Sunday worship. You take any encyclopedia, and you're going to read that all of the heathen worshipped the sun. They did it in South America with the Incas. They did it in Central America with the Mayas. They did it in Europe with the Teutonic tribes. And they did it in America when they started. That's another story with the pilgrims where they had Sunday Walk. And I have a copy of the Sunday Walk. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it didn't pass. It was presented and it was uh, voted out. But we have exactly the Sunday law, what it's going to read, what it's going to say, and how it was removed. It was the Blair Sunday rest bill with six sections to it. Point by point, what they're going to ask society to uphold. With exceptions. Okay, with exceptions. In this new mandate, Project 2025, they talk about Sabbath because they talk about us. They say we need to give them their day off is going to be the excuse. We will be in the exception. They're not going to come directly after us. They're going to say, we're going to make this for the common good. Everyone to rest on their holy day. If your holy day is, is Saturday, you can have that day off. It's okay. But then that'll change. And we need to be ready. Jesus is even at the door. He said, the door of your heart. And we need to lift a standard in our life in our homes, to follow him. If Jesus said it, I believe it. And that's how it's. God bless you. Thank you so much for your attention. Amen. Amen.